We move on to FireEye and Luke McNamara. Shoot the trail, little kill. Too many women with too many pills. I got shoot the trail, little kill. I got my mind and I'm ready to go. Firewheel is I shoot the trail. To thrill. <laughs> it, was, it was breaking with the, the Beatles streak we had going. Oh, okay, fine. Sure. Um, perfect. Thank yeah. you at least for taking us into some heavy rock. Partly yeah. my fault, too, because I chose Beatles. You, you have to relax. You, have to, you, you live a busy life. And any working in IT has a complex, involved life. How do you cope? Uh, so I think it's trying to find things that are the exact opposite of working on a computer, working on uh, you know, virtual environments and things like that. So for me, it's uh, working with my hands, building things, uh, building, I like to build like furniture and coffee tables. Uh, very, very poor quality, but it's a, it's sure a great not. way to, to relax. And, You're a man and of fine of, detail. It can't be poor quality. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the detail, I don't know if it, it transfers over to the, the woodworking. But exactly. It, it's that's the way my that, point. It's the relaxation. That yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it is true, isn't it? I mean, you know, anyone working in a technical industry, particularly IT, has got to be focused on a lot of, a lot of fine detail. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that you're, you're trying to keep track of and look at, and uh, it's very cognitively engaging, and mm. so sometimes just doing something where uh, you can kind of relax and, and let go. Uh, Excellent, and you save some money. You get a piece of furniture you do. or something yeah. you really want, and yeah. you didn't have to pay so much yes. for it. You have it's to just, and you benefit in many ways. Multiple benefits. Your yeah. mind benefits and your bank balance benefits. Yeah. I think we need your presentation. Awesome. Luke McNamara, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. Thank you. I was looking for that. Uh, well, thank you all uh, for having me here, and thank you to, to Real Security. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in beautiful Slovenia. Um, my name is Luke McNamara. I work at FireEye uh, within the intelligence part of our company, and uh, today I'm here to talk about the threat landscape, what we're seeing uh, across the globe, from a variety of different threat actors, uh, what it is that they're doing, the tools they're using, uh, and, and help you guys try to make sense of all of that. Um, so I think a little bit of background that will be useful and kind of explain our perspective in looking at this. Uh, there's actually kind of three different parts of our, our company, um, and we get data from all of those different entities that allows us to kind of build out, a, I think, a, a pretty complete threat picture. So we have the, the global sensor network of, of FireEye products, so we get a lot of good information around campaigns. Uh, we can see you know, victimology, who's being targeted uh, across a similar set of activity. Um, we also have the many incident responders that go in and they have insight on the tools that attackers and adversaries are using for lateral movement or the sort of data that they're trying to exfiltrate. Um, and then we have the other part of our company that focuses on the adversarial intelligence. Right, so what are um, cyber criminals selling in the underground? Uh, what sorts of sets of data are they trying to get access to? What campaigns are they planning? So all that comes back into the threat intelligence hub, uh, and that helps us kind of build out an intelligence picture, taking that data, turning it into intelligence, uh, and trying to understand what we're, we're seeing uh, across this very varied uh, threat landscape. So I was trying to come up with a theme or an idea of how, you know, and maybe one sort of idea uh, can you explain or um, put some sort of uh, uh, framework around uh, the very diverse and varied threat activity we see? Um, and one of the things, the, one of the ideas I came up with, uh, you know, I'll, I'll suggest here for the purpose of this talk, is that what we're increasingly seeing across the threat landscape, depending on who's being targeted, uh, across the adversary motivation, is this common theme. We're seeing an increasing complexity of behavior from the threat actors, but a simplicity of the methods, a simplicity of the methods that they're using. So that's what I'm going to suggest uh, today, and I'm going to go through and, and provide some examples that hopefully supports this. Uh, but this is the sort of framework that, that I'm going to approach this talk on threat landscape today. So what do I mean by this? Well, and actually a great example of this is what happened yesterday in Norway, uh, where you had a ransomware attack. Um, 
And I think now, after seeing things like Wanna Cry and Not Petya, um, it's really difficult to kind of look at something just on the surface as soon as that sort of uh, threat emerges, as soon as that activity takes place, and immediately be able to link that to criminal behavior. Uh, and that's because there is a, a now more than ever a diverse set of actor uh, behaviors across the different types of adversaries we see. So it could be a nation state. It could be a hacktivist that's involved in something. You know, we use this term APT to, to reference a lot of the nation state threat activity we see. Uh, and that A stands for advanced. Well, the reality is a lot of the APTs that we track, uh, at least compared to uh, what we've seen historically, aren't really that advanced when you look at the tools they're using or even some of the methodologies that they employ, the TTPs they utilize once they get into an adversary environment. Um, at the same time, you see a lot of cyber criminal groups that have adapted and adopted some of those same techniques. So they're using the same sort of skills to conduct targeted intrusions into organization environments um, that the nation states were using in the past. So you see both sides kind of learning from each other. And nation states obviously trying to kind of, at times, mask uh, their activity under the guise, the probable guise of, of criminal activity, whether it's North Koreans going after and stealing cryptocurrencies, uh, or things like NotPetya, uh, activities that look like ransomware but are actually more destructive in nature. And then hacktivism. You know, five years ago, if we were having this uh, talk uh, about hacktivism, we'd probably focus heavily on anonymous and lulsec. And the reality is that activity still kind of continues in various forms, the sort of true ideological motivated uh, hacktivist actors. But the reality is also that we see a lot of these personas increasingly being employed by nation state groups as a way to carry out some sort of political uh, persuasion, disinformation campaigns, uh, using hacking and leaking as a way to influence the environment. Uh, so again, the behavior of what we're seeing is increasingly complex. However, the tools that we're seeing to do this uh, are, are not so in a lot of the cases. A lot of the campaigns that we see week in and week out, uh, and these are by some of the actors you know, in the APT category and even some of the advanced, what we call FIN, or advanced cyber criminal category. These are, are groups that have access, uh, we've seen, to their own bespoke custom tool sets, right? So they have some pretty powerful uh, nation state development resources behind them to create custom malware. Uh, and we've seen evidence that they continue to employ that. But what I find fascinating is that uh, increasingly over the last couple years, this is a trend we really saw you know, beginning maybe in 2016, 2017, really get established in 2018, and I think we'll see continue throughout this year, uh, is that a lot of what they're doing is using tools like PowerShell Empire or Cobalt Strike Beacon. Uh, potentially, you know, in kind of the early stages. So this is a chart here that looks at across multiple APT and FIN groups that we track, some of the publicly available tools that these groups are leveraging. Uh, why is that? Well, on one hand, uh, low cost, right? It's very easy to, to kind of access these tools. They're good enough in many respects to carry out their operation. Um, I would say across the board, it's a bit of a generalization, but across the board, I think APT and nation state actors care a lot less about uh, being linked or attributed uh, and found out, at least in the long term. Certainly in the kind of the near term for operational security and be able to carry out their mission, uh, they, they care about it. But these tools allow them, they're good enough, uh, they allow them to carry out their mission and do what they want. It also allows them to blend into the noise. So these same tools that pen testers are using, these same tools that lower end, lower skilled criminals are using, uh, it allows them to kind of blend into the noise, and that makes our job harder. There's more work we have to do to go further down that attack chain and look at uh, what are the other tools we see being deployed? What does it look like the adversary is interested in doing? What sort of data are they targeting or trying to, to steal? Uh, what systems are they trying to, to impact and affect? Uh, so all of this, I think, comes together and uh, you know, makes it a lot harder. Uh, you know, it, it kind of muddies the water of what we're looking at. The behaviors are more diverse. The tools and the techniques they're using are very simple. We also see, uh, you know, amongst some emerging actors, a prevalence for doing very basic credential collection. Nothing that's very technically sophisticated. Uh, the usage of macro-enabled documents. All of this, I think, fits into this category of uh, very, very simple methods that are being utilized uh, by actors that know what they're going after in kind of interesting new ways. So what are they doing? What are the threat actors doing? Well, let's start with some data. Uh, and this comes from uh, a, a recent report we put out every year called M-Trends, looking kind of at the state of the breaches that we respond to and the data we collect. Um, what are we seeing, right? Well, so probably to no surprise to anyone in this room, uh, pretty much every sector we see targeted, right? Everyone is being targeted. Um, 
probably also no surprise, financial is up there is, is probably uh, one of the biggest ones. Um, but again, you see pretty much every sector here represented uh, in terms of activity uh, you know, facing them, uh, whether it's threats to continuity of operations by things like destructive malware and ransomware, or uh, theft of data, theft of IP, et cetera. I think one of the more interesting things, and in, uh, this is in the last couple of years we've done more to kind of track and look at this metric, is looking at uh, retargeting of, of organizations. So organizations that we go in and maybe we respond to a breach or an incident there, um, tracking kind of what happens after that. Well, it's interesting to see that we see an increase from 2017 to 2018 of if you were targeted in the last 19 months, the chances of you being targeted again uh, is increasingly higher, uh, either by the same actor or similar motivation. So I think that's also an interesting thing when you, we think about, um, yes, in some cases, adversaries will go after a softer target if you know, they go after a, a target that's pretty hardened, has good defenses, kicks them out. But we're also seeing the fact that a lot of organizations are continued to be targeted after the adversaries have been kicked out. So long term, this kind of represents uh, a long standing issue uh, of dealing with some of the same adversaries over and over again, uh, and that the fight doesn't uh, stop. So drilling down deeper into various adversary motivations, nation state activity, right? The, the big one. What are we seeing? Well, it's interesting, uh, I guess on some kind of highlight, high level notes, we'll, we'll jump into uh, looking at a few specific uh, nation states and countries. But we do see um, kind of a, a growing interest amongst certain sets of actors to go kind of further up the information supply chain, if you will. Um, so going after things like telecoms, going after things like uh, managed service providers, uh, entities that allow them access to either a lot of organizations' data, or when you think about cases like uh, Medoc several years ago in Ukraine, um, allow them to spread malware out into multiple organizations and get into the networks um, because they've compromised a, a trusted vendor. I think this represents a challenge also in really understanding kind of the growing trends and risks. Right? Because if you're simply tracking the number of breaches that we respond to or the number of breaches that we see in a particular sector, it could be that the amount of data that's being stolen, uh, the amount of data that's being harvested, uh, is actually greater now than it has been in the past. We're just seeing a fewer number of breaches. So this is kind of similar to a trend we've seen in the past where, for example, law firms get targeted because they have access to a lot of organization-sensitive data. Um, so again, it's kind of interesting to see that happen. We see that in particular from a lot of uh, Chinese threat groups. Um, DNS hijacking. So this is a, a recent one we've we put out some reporting and blogs about um, from some suspected Iranian threat activity. Again, I think it's an in interesting trend if you kind of put it in the category of moving further up the chain, moving away from targeting uh, individuals, individual accounts. We certainly see that, but I think we're also seeing as organizations or, or as... Um, groups mature their capabilities, the focus on the targets they go after changes. And they will also want to have some of that access to entities that they can uh, gather a lot of data from uh, and do a lot of collection. And then, you know, destructive malware. So uh, obviously, you know, and it was talked about already today, but uh, things like WannaCry and, and not Petya uh, being a big wake-up call in terms of the impact that uh, some of the destructive tools we can see uh, being utilized and being put out there, the sort of impact they can have, even for organizations that weren't the initial targets, which I think is in particular the really concerning thing. Um, you know, we haven't really seen something of that same magnitude or that same way yet, but that sort of destructive attack is still happening. Uh, and I think one of the, the interesting and, and really alarming ways that we saw that this last year was with Triton Malware. So this is malware that was found um, targeting the energy sector uh, in, a, in a Gulf nation. Uh, and what was particularly insidious about this destructive tool was the fact that it went after safety controls. Right? So not only are you dealing with a very critical sector being targeted and the impact for that being quite severe, but also now looking at malware that could, uh, you know, when fully deployed, when fully operationalized and working correctly, could lead to loss of life. Uh, so we still see interest by nation states in at least employing uh, and trialing out some of these things. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to kind of see how that exists in the, the future. I mentioned some of the activity we're doing tracking uh, uh, Chinese threat groups. And, and one of the ones, one of the kind of big questions in general right now is the extent to which Chinese espionage activity has it returned to kind of like the peak levels we saw back in 2013 and, and earlier. Um, so this is a chart looking at several of the groups that we track. Uh, not an exhaustive list, but 
interesting to note, you see this sort of decline in threat activity by these groups, kind of in general in terms of their targeting, whether it's in a region or uh, going after Western organizations. But what's interesting is starting to see this emergence of groups that were dormant for a while and are reemerging. In some cases, they pivoted to new tools. Um, in some cases, using the same tools, different infrastructure, um, or they're using kind of shared, uh, similar code bases. Uh, it's also interesting to look at some of the, the cases where the malware is the same, uh, the infrastructure is the same that we've observed before, but they're going after different target sets. So maybe in the past, they were going after um, you know, journalists covering Tibet or um, dissidents in Hong Kong. Uh, they're now pivoting and targeting a telecom. Right, so there's a changing of missions uh, as there's been kind of a reorganization of uh, who kind of owns that uh, within China. Um, some of the stuff that's been publicly written about kind of the reorganization within the PLA. But very interesting to kind of look at and, and track uh, from a trend perspective. Um, this is also not exhaustive, but looking at some of the, the places that we responded to or saw um, examples of, of Chinese threat activity last year, uh, you can see it's pretty much across the board globally. Um, one of the specific things I'll call out with this that I think is interesting is uh, you saw in um, uh, one of the most recent groups that we've been tracking, APT40, uh, they've been particularly focused around the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and we've seen targeting that spread from uh, you know, Cambodia and targeting of kind of entities related to the elections in Cambodia, which is kind of a, a, a strategic node in this network, this trade route, all the way up through Europe into to Belarus and the Czech Republic. Um, and using kind of lures related to that to go after entities that uh, maybe in the government, maybe they have some involvement in um, you know, clearing certain projects uh, as part of this initiative. So very interesting to kind of witness uh, that activity is still very widespread and global. Um, North Korean threat activity, uh, also not an exhaustive list, but I think one of the interesting things to note is that if you were going to tell banks in Latin America a year ago, hey, you need to pay attention to what North Korean APT groups are doing, the tools they're evolving, how they're carrying out their activity, uh, they, they probably wouldn't care too much. They're like, why would we ever be targeted with that? Uh, but what we've seen in, in this sort of uh, criminalization and the way that they've employed uh, their threat activity to go after the SWIFT, nef SWIFT network, go after banks, go after cryptocurrency exchanges, I think is very interesting when you look at uh, nation state activity as a whole. And again, evidence of why we need to be uh, maintaining visibility of these groups as their operations and interests evolve. Uh, same thing with Iran. Uh, a lot of the activity is focused in the Gulf. Again, kind of a similar point I would make, um, you know, paying attention to uh, what they do there because that activity can evolve and, and spread elsewhere. So learning what new tools are they trialing out. Russia, uh, kind of a similar thing. You know, we still see APT28 as probably one of the most widespread uh, uh, threat actors, um, particularly in Europe, uh, from, from Russia, um, but also evidence of activity from some of the other groups as well, Sandworm and, and, and others. Um, I think it's actually a good point to actually talk about, um, in particular, a sector of threat activity that is getting a lot of discussion now, and that's uh, cyber threats to elections. Uh, so what are we seeing around that? Well, so on, on one level, and I, I think this is kind of useful to break it out this way because I think everything kind of gets thrown into the election meddling bucket now. Um, so separating out kind of the different threats we see, on one hand, you've got disinformation, right? So this is the sort of social media-enabled uh, activity we see on, on uh, Facebook and Twitter, uh, sort of you know, internet research agency-sponsored accounts. We see Iran do a lot of this too, kind of similar TTPs. They kind of push various political messaging. A lot of uh, the activity now we see from this is kind of more focused on amplifying kind of whatever is a current narrative or maybe there's a, uh, a debate that is going on within a certain society and they try to exploit that and, and kind of drive controversial opinions. And then the other category is, is cyber espionage, right? And I think this is going to happen probably for, for most big elections, um, not just by Russian threat actors. We see China do a lot of this, uh, but targeting things like election commissions, targeting political parties, people running. And I wouldn't really put this in the category of interference. I think this kind of happens just in general uh, from a lot of nation state threats. Where it really gets into the interference uh, area is when you start seeing these two combined into a hack and leak campaign, right? So this is data that's you know um, stolen uh, from let's say a political party. Uh, we saw this like for example with the, the DNC in, in 2016, and then using social media, using some of these hacktivist personas to leak that information out there to try to have an impact and influence the outcome of an election. Uh, so I think we'll continue to see that in, in varying cases, um, but certainly that's where we're really starting to get into to specific interference. And then, the, of course, the big one that everyone is, is concerned about, um, and we've not seen any real successful uh, direct evidence of, um, partially because the attack surface is much smaller, 
but it's one also where I think that it's, it's very opaque, and that's the targeting of key uh, electoral infrastructure. So things like you know, voting machines, um, election management systems, tools used to tally votes. Um, that also is a, is a major concern when you think about the ability to uh, you know, delete or alter votes uh, and really have a, an impact on the outcome of election. Uh, and that's pivoting off of that, it's a great place to talk about hacktivism and information operations. Right? So what are we seeing there? So again, a lot of the, the personas that we see now, um, you know, personas like uh, Cyber Bear Coot, Fancy Bear's Hack Team, um, Kutzefer 2.0, uh, a lot of like the big ones that get coverage now uh, are really either kind of nation state sponsored or supported in some way uh, and are being used to, to leak out information. Um, most of the activity, like I said, that we see now is really the amplification of current narratives rather than trying to start something um, kind of original. Um, so that's interesting to see if that will that changes uh, over time. We've also started to see Iran pick this up and utilize similar disinformation uh, tactics uh, on, on social media platforms. And I think when you think about um, just the capability to build this out, you know, it's very, very basic to build some sock puppet accounts and then have them kind of push a narrative. So I think if we're considering how other nations may get into the space and utilize this, uh, utilize these platforms, this is very, very uh, low capability uh, and compare that with, uh, or, or combine that with a very basic intrusion capability and doing hacking and leaking, uh, you can have a very big impact in some cases. So it'll be interesting to track this specifically going forward. Uh, some examples of that there. Cybercrime. So what are we seeing within the cybercrime space? Well, I alluded to a little bit earlier, um, but you know, we're, we're increasingly seeing uh, actors find new ways to monetize compromises to uh, an organization or to a system that they, they've taken over. Um, you have things like the CEO fraud that's still widespread, commodity malware that's still widespread. But I think where it's really worth digging down into and looking specifically is the targeted uh, types of cyber threats that we see in the criminal space. So groups like Fin7 and some of these more advanced groups um, that conduct intrusions uh, that look for specific data. Uh, groups, some of the newer ones that we track, a group called Temp Demon that compromises um, organizations and then sells access uh, to that organization to, to people in the underground. Um, and some of these are not kind of new tactics that have existed for a while, but we're seeing increasing interest by actors in, in kind of utilizing that. Um, shifting activity by Fin7 that goes after a lot of organizations. Recently, we've seen them kind of you know, be interested in, and focused on cryptocurrency, um, which I think is interesting. Uh, and again, using macro-enabled documents to deliver some of their malware. One of the, the, the big things I think is, is really needed to be talked about more within the ransomware space is the trend towards targeted ransomware. So I was looking back at some of our data at um, where we had kind of the, the number of detections for different ransomware families. And what's interesting is you had ransomware families like GANCRAB that I think probably had some of the, the highest number of detections. But where you see the most impact in terms of organizations paying out or systems being compromised, critical systems being compromised and affected, it's things like Ryuk or Samas or SamSam, uh, Dharma. Some of these more targeted campaigns where, you know, to the, the, the top uh, version is an example of this, where they, they deploy ransomware post-compromise. So think about if you're a hospital and you have this, you have an actor that, that, that breaks in, they pivot out through the network, they uh, find kind of sensitive records or, or even worse, you know, biomedical devices that may be attached to that network, and they, they compromise those. Why do they focus on those? Well, because they believe there's a higher likelihood that they pay out, that the organization is going to pay out. Um, and you see this in different sectors as well. Um, you know, uh, cyber criminal groups focusing on where can I maximize my chance for getting profit by focusing on key assets. So rather than just kind of the shotgun approach where I spread this out here, maybe I infect some critical systems, maybe I infect some critical systems of someone who has the means to pay, um, focusing instead on what organizations do I want to go after that I think is going to pay, that I think will pay, and then how do I get in there, delete their backups, uh, and, 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 and compromise the, uh, the critical systems that uh, they need to continue their business. The other interesting thing I think you need to talk about with ransomware is the relationship between ransomware and crypto miners, right? So these are both disruptive activity, and they're both examples of actors uh, using different ways to kind of co uh, to monetize the access they have to a compromised system. Um, so we've sp spoken a little bit about kind of the targeted nature of ransomware, and I think that is certainly more in, let's say, the advanced operator category, actors that are going to go move laterally through a network, go find those critical assets and, and compromise them. But for those lower skilled actors, I think we're seeing more of a, a change to look at things where they can maximize their profit 
while reducing the risk. So when you think about ransomware, it's noisy. You know when you've been compromised, you get the message. Uh, crypto miner activity, you know, you have it installed on a system, maybe, maybe you notice it's running slower. Um, but other than that, it's a much lower risk. Law enforcement attention, I think, is not quite there to it yet, the same way as ransomware. Um, in many cases, it's kind of considered a nuisance. So we've, it's interesting to, to see this sort of uptick in crypto miner activity at the same time that there's been a decrease in some of the ransomware uh, threats overall, ransomware um, uh, detections overall. Again, that's leaving aside that more targeted uh, ransomware, which I think probably you, know, you have a different kind of class of criminal that's gravitating towards that. But it's interesting to see this trend and the relationship between the two. Um, it'll be interesting to see if this remains the case going forward. Uh, if we continue to get kind of declining prices of cryptocurrency, is that going to change things in the, the risk calculus? Uh, but one thing I think that's worth kind of considering in conjunction with ransomware. So now for some good news <laughs> after all of that. Um, and I think a lot of times, you know, we focus on kind of like, you know, the, the, uh, the threats that are out there, the overwhelming kind of resources that nation states and organized crime and in these advanced criminal groups have to bring to bear. But there is some good news to, to kind of look at and see in this space. Uh, so some of the statistics that we pulled from uh, looking at last year, what we were responding to. It's interesting to see that the, uh, the dwell time is trending down. So if you look at this uh, dark bar in the middle of these charts, uh, you know, in 2015, it was 146 days. That's now down to 78. And that varies by region. Um, you know, in North America and EMEA, it tends to be a little bit more mature, so the detection time is, is uh, you know, greater. Uh, dwell time is much shorter for the adversaries. APJ and other regions, that number is higher. Um, so I think maturity is definitely uh, an interesting part of it. Talking about detection sources, this is another, I think, very positive metric to look at. And that's the continued increase in the amount of detections of intrusions and compromise and incidents uh, from internal sources. So these are organizations, companies, uh, detecting these th things internally before law enforcement approaches them. Or a security company like us says, hey, I think you're, you're compromised. Uh, so overall, I think these are some very positive numbers to look at. And I think point to there are some, some real payouts uh, that we're seeing in terms of organizations actually maturing their capability, being able to kind of counter some of these threats, getting more mature, better at identifying, uh, using threat intelligence better within their environments. Um, and it'll be interesting to kind of see, you know, next year, do we see a continued decrease? Are we going to see kind of a flat line uh, in terms of dwell time? Uh, I think in, in many cases that's still too long when you think about, you know, was it 78 days or so? That's a lot of time for uh, attackers or, or um, criminals or espionage operators to be in your network and, and to be doing uh, damage. So I started off with this, uh, you know, kind of quote uh, in, or this theme about we're seeing this increasing complexity of behavior. Um, but the simplicity of the methods. Uh, one thing I'll, I guess, kind of leave you with is, you know, the technologies, tools, and methods change, but the motivations, uh, the motivations of cyber criminals, the motivations of nation states, can help provide us with some constant uh, in understanding these cyber threats. So as we adapt and we build new technologies, as we see more cloud adoption, um, as more organizations are interested in trying out blockchain as a new kind of way to secure and store their data, it's not that these new systems are necessarily going to be more secure. Adversaries are still going to find ways around them or, or ways to, to try to attack and, and, uh, and intrude into them. Uh, but I think with an understanding of what the end motivations of nation states um, you know, to, to carry out political um, interference or collect data, gain strategic information advantage, to understand the motivations of cyber criminals, right? How can I maximize my profit, lower my risk? Um, how can I make money? How can I monetize access to a system I've compromised? I think understanding these uh, fundamental like, motivations can help us in trying to kind of understand um, as behavior changes, as the tools change, they can provide us some constant and also hopefully help us stay a couple steps ahead of the adversary. So thank you for your time. And if you want to know more about uh, kind of how we utilize this in an operational construct, I would definitely recommend come and see our cyber attack simulation later on this afternoon. Thank you.